The Lord be with you. As you turn in your copy of Holy Scripture to the fourth chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Every time I hear or, or we sing that song, I'm always reminded of a man named Ron Hilburn, who was uh, the interim minister of music at First Baptist Hoover while I was in college, and I think he's still the interim uh, there now. But Ron's the uh, music minister emeritus of the church where I was ordained, Shades Crest. And Ron would often sing that song, I think, when... Uh, Frankly, I think no one else would sing uh, for him at Hoover, but it always makes me think of Ron. So thank you. That special guy still still with us, but I thank, thank you for reminding me of him and of that message. Matthew chapter 4 is where we are this morning. We'll begin with verse 23, be re- or, sorry, verse 12 and reading uh, to verse 23. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O Lord... Give us ears to hear, ears to hear your words as they speak to us, as they shape us, as they call us. And Lord, give us hearts that are open, hands and feet that are ready to respond. We pray in Christ's name, amen. So, recently, I've had what what might be called a minor crisis of faith. The coffee pot in my my kitchen uh, stopped making my coffee hot. That's it. That's that's the whole thing. And so, uh, I I began the search, as we all do these days, for a new coffee pot. Uh, I went on Amazon, which that's what you do, right? To look, uh, don't 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 do that. Don't go on Amazon looking for coffee pots. If you're like me, you spend a long time looking. They're the the most simple ones that just have a switch you turn on. Those cost like a hundred dollars. That kind of blew my mind a little bit. Um, there are those that have all kinds of digital settings and can grind your beans for you and all that. But what 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 caught me was how so many of them have a mode or a button called bold. I thought, man, what kind of coffee is bold? Do you brew it in the morning and wake up ready to fight crime? What is it? Bold. It's one of those those words, those terms people use, I think, to describe things that are just a bit extra. You know, if you're typing something and you want to make someone pay attention to it, you just hit, as I do, control B, or you go up there and you click bold. And people start to pay attention. Bold is one of those words you use for things that, that might go a little farther than one might want to go. Those things that are a bit more, I guess, flavorful, a bit brighter, maybe, a tad more audacious. I'd say to call someone or something bold might be to call them courageous. To perhaps possess a bit more courage than sense at times. Which is why I think to call someone bold may insinuate that he or she is somehow careless 
or irresponsible. The word bold brings to my mind thoughts of people who speak up in a crowd when a racist joke is told. Of those folks who refuse to give into the fads of the day and go along with things just because it feels right, but instead says, well, the way I've had it always works, and nothing's wrong with it now. To say someone is bold also conjures up for me images of those who raise their hand when no one else will to offer an answer only to be told they're wrong. Those who risk their life savings on a new adventure only to have it blow up in their face. Sure enough, uh, to be called bold, I think, as a person is to run the risk of being seen as someone whose intellect is perhaps inferior to those who possess the ever-elusive quality of common sense. But in spite of all this, I can't help but think that this passage of Scripture we've read this morning is a clear example of real boldness. I mean, you can start right in the middle of it. Right there with Simon and his brother Andrew. There they were, Matthew tells us, casting their nets into the sea. And I love what Matthew says, you know, in case we were confused, because they were fishermen. And when Jesus comes almost strolling by, you get the the impression that Jesus was just taking a break for the day, walking by the sea, saying to these two brothers, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And then rather than them saying, well, hold on, who are you? Do you have some credentials? Wait, is fishing for people legal in Galilee? What are you talking about? Instead, Matthew says in the very next verse, immediately they left their nets and followed him. Now, I know most of us have probably heard that story at least, at least a dozen times. And it's a story that I think gets recapitulated in the big vacation Bible school machine every summer. And I'm sure you've probably heard it explained time and time again that what this is is a clear example of the, the compulsion of Christ. This, this power that Jesus has to just speak this word of commission and suddenly these two brothers drop what they have to follow this man who seems otherwise to be a complete stranger. Now, if that's all there is to this story, it's still a pretty good story. It'd still be one I think you could preach. But I believe there's something more to it, something, well, something bolder. Of course, you could say uh, about Simon and Andrew the same things about James and John in the verses that follow. Matthew says that as Jesus went on after talking to Andrew and Simon, he saw two brothers, James and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called them. And what does Matthew say? Did they ask for papers? Did they ask for proof? Did they ask for credentials? No. Immediately, they left their boat and their father and followed him. And again, I'm sure you've heard this one just as many times as you've heard the one about Simon and Andrew. I mean, Matthew sticks them so close together, you can't really separate them in his gospel. And again, I'm sure you've heard it explained as this exemplary account of someone just dropping what they're doing in order to follow Jesus. But again, I think when we dig down past what we think we already know, when we dig down past the familiar just a bit deeper, I think we begin to see the boldness of these four fishermen from Galilee. You see, Matthew does us a favor with this story and gives us a pretty good sort of geographical location for the whole thing, even complete with Matthew's sort of opening chapters, his signature of quoting Isaiah. He tells us that when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee He left Nazareth, made his home in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. Y'all know where that is, right? I think there's a target in Naphtali. Galilee, Capernaum, Zebulun, Naphtali. These are significant places. And not only only because Isaiah mentions them and Matthew quotes them, Zebulun and Naphtali were the first tribes traditionally who were carted off by the Assyrians in the northern kingdom in 722 B.C. But they're not important just for that. They're all part of the region called the Galilee. Capernaum was on the sea itself, 
It was and still is a town primarily supported by fishermen in the fish market. So it's no wonder when Jesus relocates to Capernaum, which becomes sort of his base for the rest of Matthew's gospel, it's no wonder that when he's there, he just happens upon two brothers, two sets of two brothers who are fishermen. And it's right there, right there in what seems sort of obvious and nonchalant that we really begin to see, to witness the gift of bold action from these fishermen. Because you see, when Jesus calls Simon and Andrew to come and follow him, there's a whole lot more at stake than the simple reputation and livelihood of Simon and Andrew. When Jesus issues the same call to James and John, there's more at stake than just what Zebedee thinks about it. There's more at stake than just what's he going to do now to find two other people to go fishing. When Simon, Andrew, James, and John immediately follow Jesus, it was more than just a response out of religious curiosity. When these four men left their nets, their boats, their father... They were doing more than just, hey, Dad, I'll be right back. Going to take my lunch break a little early. Going to go see what this is about. They weren't turning in a, a notice for a leave of absence. They were being bold. They left everything. After all, this is first century Galilee. There is no government assistance for the abandoned wives of fishermen. There is no Jewish women's job corps. No social security. No orphanages, no nursing homes for the aged and ill. There's only the sea, the lake, and the fish. Most importantly of all, the fishermen who catch the fish day after day, dragging their boats across the wet sand out into the water to haul in the fish, to take to the market, to sell, to bring back, to feed their families, to drive the economy and the welfare of the community. And you can bet that when four fishermen from two families suddenly drop everything to follow a man with a growing reputation as either the Christ or a crook, that that entire community would suffer the ramifications. To leave it all behind would be seen as nothing short of crazy and irresponsible. Don't you know you've got mouths to feed? Don't you know more people than just your daddy? More people than just your family that live in your house count on you to bring the fish in? You can't do that. By those being left behind, these four fishermen were crazy. But to them, their actions were bold. Of course, you and I, we might have called them anything but bold if we had been living there. You can imagine what would happen, can't you? If tomorrow morning you woke up, turned on the television, looked at your phone, scrolled through your social media feed, and it was announced that overnight the Aniston Army Depot decided, eh, we're going to cut 20% immediately. Can you imagine what life must have been like? Maybe you all heard the story uh, a while back. The, the employees of the Golden Corral down in Oxford showed up one Sunday morning, what was on the front door? A note, closed, for good. Nobody got a call, not an email. They showed up for work, it's gone. The Hardee's, I think it was down in Welburn, closed. Employees showed up, note on the door, sorry for the inconvenience, we're closed. Here's a list of other locations where you can apply for employment. Do you know how many locations were listed? None. You can imagine. It just all of a sudden, no warning, no nothing. It just gone, quits. You can imagine. What if, what if right down the road, uh, uh, JSU calls a new, hires a new president and says, you know, to save money, to make sense, let's close one out of every five years. What would that do? What would happen? It might not destroy a community, but it might come close. Most folks might move right along without ever being affected forever by the change. But those who had families, those who were there, would be forever changed. And the community as a whole would feel that shift in one way or another. When you think about that, you get the feeling, you get the idea of what happens when four fishermen in the town on the lake of Galilee suddenly drop everything 
to follow some strange preacher. Imagine those of you in construction, if you had four people to show up tomorrow who were going to shingle the roof and they didn't show. No warning, no notice. Maybe it's happened before, I don't know. What if you had two brothers, two sisters, who suddenly decided to just leave the babies in the bed, wife in the kitchen, never come home? What would happen? What if your father just didn't come back from work one day? What would happen? I kind of doubt you'd want to call them bold, wouldn't you? You might want to call them something else. But that's what we call these people when we know the story, right? That's what we call those people who give up everything to follow Jesus. We call them bold. Even if they don't know where Jesus is going. That's what we call Simon. That's what we call Andrew. We call James and John. Though I imagine, I imagine Zebedee had other words for them as he stood there in the boat with his yet-to-be-mended nets. When folks are bold like that, we want sometimes to find a better reason, someone or something to blame. Because after all, their boldness tends to leave us in the lurch, tends to leave us holding the nets, tends to leave us wondering, should we have gone? Makes us feel concerned for our family and friends who suddenly made such seemingly rash decisions. I know, I know it's for a good cause, but I don't know if they've thought it through. Don't know. And I suppose the families of these fishermen all may have even initially pointed the finger at that rabbi who came strolling by. It's at Jesus' fault. He's the one who did it. It wasn't until he decided to come walking by the lake to take their sons and husbands away. It wasn't until he came along just simply saying, follow me, that Simon and Andrew ever considered a life away from those fishy shores of Galilee. It was when Jesus came strolling along with Simon and Andrew that Zebedee's sons were compelled to follow after the man from Nazareth. Bold, that's what we might call them, knowing the story. Their families might have called them something else, and it was all Jesus' fault. And I guess at first glimpse, it can seem that way. We do, we do you and I, we live in a world where people like to, to sort of back their seemingly self-proclaimed bold actions with words of religious fervor and justification. I suppose from our side of history, we could sympathize with Zebedee, the family of Simon and Andrew. After all, what did Jesus have to lose when he came by to call these disciples? He was just some traveling prophet gathering followers. If, if it wasn't Simon and Andrew, it would have been James and John. If it wasn't James and John, well, there are plenty of people dragging their boats in, looking for something to do. He didn't seem to be doing anything bold, I suppose, Jesus, except for robbing a fishing village of its primary source of prosperity. But then again, that's only if we read the story where it is without the rest of it. Is that really all Jesus is doing, is just going around trying to gather followers? Of course not. I think if you look again at the words of Scripture, you'll find that Jesus is indeed being bold. And in his call to these fishermen, Jesus is calling them, calling us to a life of faith and bold action. Because Jesus' boldness, I think, is easy to overlook if you just read in a hurry. It starts in the very first verse. Jesus heard that John had been arrested and so he withdrew to Galilee. John the Baptist isn't just arrested, he is later beheaded. He's the one Jesus had been following, the one Jesus had been baptized by in the Jordan, and now he's been arrested. So what does Jesus do? Does he go home? Does he hide in his bedroom at Mary and Joseph's house? No. He flees to Galilee. But Galilee is probably not the friendliest place for Jesus. It's called, as Matthew points out, Galilee of the Gentiles. It's surrounded by territories normally occupied by Gentiles. It re is it really safe for a Jewish preacher proclaiming repentance and the arrival of the Jewish God to flee to a Gentile area? I mean, Matthew says he, he came proclaiming repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Isn't that the same message that John was preaching? That led to his arrest and his execution? What word would you use to describe these actions from Jesus? I think bold might be a good one. 
But it doesn't end there. Matthew tells us that Jesus went on preaching, went on preaching the good news, curing every disease and every sickness among the people. Jesus carried on. And it didn't matter. It didn't matter that these similar actions, these similar words had gotten John arrested and thrown in jail. It didn't matter that he may have well turned an entire community against him, calling their sons and their fathers away from the shores. It didn't matter that there was no security in what he was doing. It didn't even matter that his ministry of teaching, preaching, and healing, what we call the gospel, would lead to the cruelest of deaths. It didn't matter because Jesus was bold. He was bold because of his faith in God. He was bold with his own life because of his love for God and love for us. This calling on our lives is not one that comes out of comfort, not out of one that says, well, if it didn't work out, I'll do something else. It's a call to boldness that ultimately comes from Christ's example on the cross. That word bold is more than a setting on a coffee maker. It's not always... I guess an endearing term either. To call someone bold may be to insinuate that he or she is somehow careless or irresponsible. But we know better now. To be bold for Christ means to leave everything. That's what Matthew says. He doesn't say they checked out for a little while. Didn't say they packed a bag and came with him. Immediately they left everything behind when Christ calls. To be bold for Christ brings to mind for me images of feeding hungry children, housing homeless mothers, loving our enemies, caring for the strangers among us. To be bold for Christ conjures up thoughts of rebellious people who stand for justice and truth despite looking down the barrel of a gun, despite the criticisms of their community. Sure enough, to label someone bold for Christ is to deem them superior to those who cling to the otherwise easy excuse of common sense. Bold. That's what, they, that's what we call them. Simon, Andrew, James, John, Jesus. That's what they'll call you. Maybe. That's what they'll call you when you tell them you decided to live for Christ and Christ alone. That's bold. That's what they'll call you when you give hard-earned money to those who don't have an excuse, who don't have it themselves. Bold, that's what they'll call you when you give your vacation time to mission opportunities, when you open your home to a pack of high-strung youth, when you start spending more time praying and less time gossiping. Bold, that's what they'll call you when you leave everything to answer the call to follow him. Even if they call you other things. Even if they call you crazy. Even if they call you misguided. Even if they claim you're not reading the same Bible they are. Even if they say you've lost your mind because you've decided to give all you have and all you are to follow Christ. What they really mean is that you're bold. That you have the gift. You have the gift from God the call from Christ, and you have answered that call with a life of bold action. May we all be so bold as to leave it all and follow him. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray for boldness. We pray that we have the boldness to answer your call. Lord, even in times God, when it seems so easy to just let it go, to just ignore it, to justify to ourselves that we're better off, that you are better off if we don't answer. Lord, help us to have boldness, to live lives of bold action as a gift from you and as our gift to you and to others. So the Holy Spirit be with us now, stir in our presence as you call us and give us strength to respond. In Christ's name we pray, amen.